In 1855, an English inventor named Henry Bessemer announced a great new discovery, a simple, inexpensive process for converting pig iron into steel. Now regarded as the most important industrial advance in the last half of the 19th century, it was either ignored or ridiculed by British manufacturers to whom it promised most. Not until it was in wide use on the continent and in America did the inventor's own country adopt his method. Henry Bessemer gave the world the cheap steel on which modern civilization is built. Before Bessemer, England's annual steel production was 51,000 tonnes at 50 pounds per tonne. At Bessemer's death, steel had dropped to an average of 8 pounds a tonne. The world made more in a single day than England once made in a year. Henry Bessemer was born in the Hertfordshire village of Charlton on January 19, 1813. His family were of French Huguenot stock. His father, Anthony Bessemer, who fled the terror of the French Revolution, was himself a notable engineer and inventor. Young Henry had little schooling. He was much too busy with private pursuits in his father's workshop. At 17, having mastered all of his father's skills, Henry Bessemer went to London. His first important invention was a machine for embossing stamps on legal documents. The government of the day complained bitterly that it was losing £100,000 a year because crook lawyers and businessmen were removing duty stamps from old documents and using them again. Henry Bessemer devised a machine for embossing the stamps and the date of issue on the documents themselves. The government snapped up the machine and promised him a job in the stamp office. They gave him neither the job nor a farthing payment for the machine which saved them so much revenue. The machine is still in use in hundreds of government offices. For some years, Bessemer lived from one invention to another, using the proceeds of one to work on the next. The only early invention he kept was for the manufacture of gold paint. The profits gave him a comfortable income, which enabled him to devote years to his steel process until it paid off in minions. During the Crimean War, obvious faults in British artillery led Bessemer to produce a revolutionary elongated shell, which he offered to the War Office. The diehards there, who had not advanced far from the cannon and shot days of Waterloo, were not interested. Bessemer accordingly took his new shell to France, where the more progressive Napoleon III ordered his army chiefs to test it. The cast-iron guns of the day could not stand up to the powerful new shell. French experts told Bessemer he must produce a stronger metal for guns. From then on, Bessemer was fired by the need to mass-produce such a metal. Metallurgy was almost an unknown science. Bessemer had to start at the beginning. He read the few books available and plunged into active experimenting in all kinds of metal in a laboratory attached to his St Pancras home. To eliminate weakness in cast iron, he tried to produce a new metal by fusing it with steel. The patent Bessemer took out for this method was the first of a long series over the next 15 years. With his combined iron and steel, Bessemer made a small gun which was highly praised by the French. Bessemer was not satisfied with this. For a year he produced small quantities of steel by various processes. All were too costly for large-scale production. Then, on a chance visit to a foundry where pig iron was being melted in a furnace, Bessemer noticed the peculiar appearance and subsequent behaviour of iron which had been exposed to a blast of air. There and then he conceived the idea that, if air could be brought into contact with a sufficiently extensive surface of molten crude iron, the latter would be rapidly converted into malleable iron. From this pure form of iron, it was a simple process by the addition of carbon and manganese to turn out good quality steel. This became the basis of the world-famous Bessemer process. Another remarkable and revolutionary idea behind it was that no fuel was required. The combustion of impurities in the iron after air is blown through the already molten metal supplies sufficient heat to keep the mass fluid. 
in crucibles in his laboratory, Bessemer proved the idea was practicable. For a larger trial, he built a converter or container three feet in diameter and five feet high in an outhouse of his home. Into it, he ran 700 weight of molten pig iron. He told an incredulous assistant he intended to blow cold air into it to make it hot. Through the bottom of the converter, an engine forced streams of air under high pressure. Reaction was immediate and violent. A dazzling shower of sparks shot up. The dangling lid of the converter melted in the fierce heat. No one dare approach the aircock beside the converter, so the apparatus had to be left until the process, decarburization, was complete. In the converter, however, was the new metal, limpid, incandescent, malleable iron, almost too brilliant for the eye. The secret had been found. To the final, cheap, Bessemer steel was now only one step. Despite this, Bessemer worked ceaselessly on various subsidiary improvements until he took out his last steel patent in 1869, 15 years after he started on his quest. Bessemer's difficulties were not only technical. English steel makers were violently opposed to his revolutionary process and ridiculed suggestions they change over to it and pay the inventor a heavy license fee. Overseas, however, Bessemer was hailed as a genius and the process enthusiastically adopted by Krupp, the German armaments colossus, was one of the first to apply for a license to produce Bessemer steel in its sprawling works. Napoleon III, who considered the Englishman his protege, wanted to decorate him with the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honor. As a British subject, however, Bessemer could not accept. The Emperor of Austria offered Bessemer a knighthood. The King of the Belgians called personally to inspect his laboratory and congratulate him on his great discovery. At home, however, he was still considered a crackpot. But Bessemer did not take the opposition lying down. In 1859, he opened his own works in Sheffield. He undercut the other die-hard steel makers by 15 pound a tonne. As the orders slumped, they raced to adopt the hated Bessemer process. Within five years, practically every English firm was paying a license fee to Bessemer. The Bessemer method spread around the world. Steel prices came tumbling down, increasing the use of steel a hundredfold. Steel replaced iron for ships, bridges, girders for buildings, locomotive rails and boilers. Still Britain lagged behind. The Admiralty did not change the steel for warships for many years, though it had long been proved in merchant shipping. The United States was Bessemer's best supporter. Before he died, production of his steel there rose to 10 million tonnes annually, more than the rest of the world combined. Steel rocketed Bessemer into the millionaire class. From his new process alone, he netted more than two million pounds. Part of it he put into a mansion on London's Denmark Hill. Much was expended on continued experiments. In 1879, Bessemer was honoured with a knighthood. The citation said not a word about the steel process that revolutionised the age. Officially, he became Sir Henry for services to the inland revenue through his almost forgotten stamping machine. Meanwhile, the inventor turned again to armaments. He turned out hundreds of efficient large-scale weapons that were snapped up by European governments. He could sell none, however, to the British Army. As with the Navy, they were pig-headedly opposed to steel. As a result, England used iron for ordnance 20 years longer than was advisable either economically or militarily. Another successful Bessemer invention was a nail-making machine. The industry was centred in Wolverhampton, where hundreds of women forged the nails by hand. The work was called degrading and unwomanly. The new machines changed all of that. They also put the former slaves out of work, thereby earning Bessemer their undying hatred. One of Bessemer's last ideas when he was over 80 years old was for a swinging ship's saloon to prevent seasickness. 
he spent much of his steel royalties on a specially constructed steamship. Called the Bessemer, it was 350 feet long with a great saloon hung amidships on trunnions. Hydraulic machinery was supposed to keep the floor of the saloon steady and level, no matter how rough the sea. On the English Channel run, however, it did not work out that way. It increased the tossing movement and sent passengers into agonies of seasickness. Bessemer took the ship off the run, installed a normal saloon and sold it. Exaggerated cartoons and jokes about the scheme caused him to abandon it altogether. Modern experts regret this. Bessemer, they say, had the germ of a revolutionary shipbuilding idea that might have proved practical if given a fair trial. Bessemer retired to Denmark Hill. There he evolved a small diamond cutting plant which he hoped might wrest the trade monopoly from the Dutch. As a sideline, he experimented with a private observatory and special lenses designed to harness the energy of the sun for practical use. Scientists are conducting similar researches today. Bessemer's beloved wife and partner died in 1897. In March 1898, Bessemer followed her. By then, he was recognised as the father of modern industry, responsible for one of the few epochal discoveries which have changed the fate of the human race.